Before I begin, if, um, if, you, if I say anything that you might resonate with, feel free to snap, vocalize with a mm, anything that feels good to you. They say that life is a highway, but in my recovery journey, what's mattered to me the most has been the vehicle rather than the road. And nothing can compare to the feeling of being behind the wheel, as long as it's not on the pike. That's right, nothing can compare to the feeling of being in control of your destination. And that's how I feel when I'm in my hoopty. My hoopty is humble, it's, it's not a luxury car, you know, it's, it's old, it's beat up, the gaskets are broken, the brakes fail half the time, the bumper is dinged now. It may not be beautiful like cars in commercials, but it is mine, I own it. I get to decide where I go and who comes along for the ride. Now there's a radio in my hoopty. Most of the time it plays music, songs, songs I know and love and have memorized like backcountry roads. Sometimes it's not music. Sometimes the radio plays conversations, whispers, or even snippets of dialogue. Sometimes I can't make sense of it and sometimes what I hear makes me upset. All the while though, I can't change the dial. In fact, there is no dial, but I'm used to it. I've been listening to the radio all my life. I know what to expect. More importantly, it doesn't stop me from getting where I need to go. One time though, when driving my hoopty on a bumpy and unfamiliar road, a message came through the radio loud and clear. The message told me I was going to die. And not just that I would die in any way, but that I was going to die on my graduation day from college. You have to understand, I'm the first one in my family to go to college. I didn't have mentors or even that much guidance on how that was supposed to go. So you know the funny thing, when I heard that message, it brought me comfort. It meant that the stress of finishing school, let alone moving on from college and building a life I wasn't always guaranteed would be over and done with. The doctors call it sense of foreshortened future, a symptom of trauma. But when you have trauma, you already feel like you've died. For me, it was like living after the apocalypse. But living in this aftermath, I've learned how to be strong. Or maybe I was already strong, and I learned how to tap into my own resilience. To be honest, therapy and psychiatry wasn't enough for me. I was treated by clinicians who didn't take me seriously or question my experience or use the phrase high functioning in order to deny me support that I needed. No, it's through the power of storytelling that I found my voice I started to write, and I wrote even when I didn't feel like doing much else. I even wrote a whole novel. But you know, there's a component of dialectical behavioral therapy, or DBT, that says when you have a harmful impulse, you should do the opposite. So I began to understand my recovery this way. If I have a voice that tells me I should kill myself, I should do the opposite and instead give life to others. In this light, I created characters who were dealing with the same issues of trauma, both interpersonal and intergenerational. I found that when I could not give myself the compassion I needed, I could write scenes where my characters went through their own struggles and I could empathize with them. In giving life to others in my stories, I restored the life within myself. And it's also been understanding who I am and how I came to be. My father is an Indian Muslim from the island nation of Trinidad and Tobago. In Caribbean culture, we also have a word that parallels my experience. We call it tabanka. The experience of tabanka doesn't completely line up with Western, what Western psychiatry calls psychosis. Nevertheless, a masquerader might find themselves feeling tabanka after a particularly strenuous carnival, complete with emotional distress, hallucinations, and the feeling like you've lost your manners and your mind. All in all, in my recovery, I've come to understand my place in the Caribbean diaspora 
and how to use my history as a weapon for my resilience. Despite the chaos of my place of origin, I know that in the path I walk in the diaspora, I am invincible. In knowing who I am and what I am made of, I feel free. And I also share my story as it pertains to mental health. After years of struggling to hold down a job, I now work as a certified peer specialist in an outpatient program. And yes, please clap. <laughs> in, in this role, I work with young people who are also dealing with the diagnoses of psychosis and schizophrenia. This opportunity has allowed me to find my purpose, and I'm proud to say that in October, I celebrated one year of service. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in that role, I feel the impact that I have by sharing my story and being present every day that I work. I wanna take a moment to say that if you or someone you know is struggling with voice hearing, hallucinations, paranoia, or any other type of severe emotional distress, know that there is hope for recovery. On the table outside where you walked in, you'll find some resources for seeking support for psychosis in Massachusetts. And even if you don't know someone personally who has these experiences, know that we exist and we're working towards our goals and that you're just as valuable as an ally in helping destigmatize severe mental illness in the path that you walk in life. Yeah, exactly. So in conclusion, recovery is real. Can I get you guys to say that? Recovery is real. But the sad truth is that the odds are stacked against us. Our society doesn't intrinsically provide for the community coming together to collectively heal and advocate for ourselves. So we must share our stories when the time is right. We must demand better from the system that holds us in its hands. And we must hold each other accountable in a loving and affirming way. And when it's time for us to move forward, the backseat of my Hope D will always be open to you. Thank you.